a lot of white guitar players will say Beck and Clapton and yourself, you know, the great uh, guitar triumvirate of the 60s and 70s as, as major influences. Uh, but he seems to think that you were sort of a bit different in your approach to the blues, uh, different from Clapton and Beck, that is. And he cites the example of drinking muddy waters. Games, drinking muddy water, yeah, water yeah, time. which is, as he's saying, is rolling and tumbling right, exactly. roots. But just in so much as that is howling wolf, meet me in the bottom, is also howling wolf. Right, okay. It's called meet me in the bottom. Uh -huh. Is also, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there's just as many. Uh, the point there is that you you seem to uh, that seemed to break new ground. Ah, it probably did. Water. Well, it probably did. I mean, it, uh, it, it, yeah, it, in those days, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Once you know, I was actually recording stuff that I was being involved in writing. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but I think even you know, with Zeppelin, our approach to the blues was even you know it wasn't just leaning on the traditional sort of uh, emulating what there was before. It was taking it onwards into another dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. It, it, Thinking back in retrospect, what, what do you think you did to the blues? I mean, well, purely what I just said then, uh -huh. just taking it into another dimension. Uh -huh. That dimension being? Uh, something that hadn't been done before. Can you just made it louder and harder? Or no, not this, no, no, I wouldn't say louder. Mm -hmm. Maybe more intense. I wouldn't, say, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say louder because the whole thing about Zeppelin was that it could be you know, like thunder one moment and like a whisper the next within the same song. Mm -hmm. You know, light and shade. Mm, I see. Okay. So maybe more light and shade. Um, Perspective. Certainly, uh, yeah, and, and the dramatic quality as well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, do you think you were more flexible with the blues than, say, Clapton and Beck were, whereas they tended to put it up on a pedestal and deify the Well, musicians? for a start, you see, Eric, um, in, especially in the days of John Mayall, where he actually made his reputation as a blues player, was actually digesting all these different players like uh, Freddie King, BB King, etc., 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 and actually playing those phrases, linking them all up together. Whereas I was more in, more intent in coming up with my own phrasing for blues and my own approach to to playing it, just in the same way as with the riffs. I mean, I always came up with original riffs, purely through, you know, just searching. Mm -hmm. Do you think that those, uh, like But they put them, put them on the pe pedestal. Yeah. Whereas you were a little more flexible, you thought, well, well it's just one style, and you sort of uh, used that as your, uh, as, as one medium. Well, you, you see, well, well, wait a minute. You, um, I think Eric certainly did. I don't know whether Jeff did, um, because my... My roots weren't, and, and neither were Eric's or Jeff's, just blues. Even though Eric, uh, you know, made that his niche, so to speak. He, uh, um, you know, my, my roots went back to the, to the early, early rock and roll, you see. The, but, and everything that was guitar orientated anyway, as did Jeff's. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, uh, my interest basically was in the guitar as an instrument with six strings and what could be done with it. Um, and that just didn't include just playing blues or just playing rock and roll. It included playing, you know, acoustic music and, uh, you know, you know, well, you know what I've done, so. Good. I was approached, actually after the Sonny Boy Williamson sessions, by Giorgio Gamelski, the manager, and he said uh, that um, Eric was giving problems, and uh, he didn't want to uh, do this, and he didn't want to do that, and would I, would I join the Arbors? Would I, re you know, replace it? And I didn't want to be part of anything like that. In other words, they were trying an underhand move, stab in the back. And I didn't uh, want to do that. Trying to kind of maneuver him out of the band. Yeah, I certainly wasn't going to be the, the man to, to, to cut Eric's, you know, stab Eric in the back. But uh, it, basically it was because he didn't want to get that commercial, apparently. That's what it was all about. But... Um, then it came to the point where Eric actually left, and
and um, I was approached again. Well, this time now Eric's left, so you know it's free for you to join without any any sort of conscience. And I, I said, no, I don't think so. But I, you know, I know a man who who you should really check out, and I and I think he'd be perfect for the band. Um, and that, of course, was was Jeff. Hmm. So uh, that was that. The rest is history. Yeah. He uh, heard a rumor once that uh, there was supposed to be a, a, a live Yardbirds album, but you were not happy with it all because of the sound quality. Mm -hmm. So you bought up all the copies and made sure that nobody. Uh, uh, okay, the album we're referring to is live at the Anderson Theatre, <coughs> and Epic had had uh, said, "Would we, would we consider um, a live recording?" So we said, "Yeah, sure, that sounds good." That sounds good. And they sent down their staff producer. His name was Manny Kellum. Well, bless his heart, it wasn't his fault. But he'd only been used to doing light orchestral music in the past. And here he is f facing this whole problem of recording a band live on the stage, you know. And he just didn't know how to approach it. He didn't know what to do. He had one microphone on the drum kit. And... Uh, it was obviously going to be a total failure. But the most, most important thing about it was that Keith Ralph, um, it wasn't one of his good nights. And we had the power of, of uh, you know, of, of, of artistic decision on this as to whether it, you know, should, you know, whether, whether we'd let it go further on after that, because obviously you don't just let somebody record you live and let them put it out. You know, you have an artistic decision on this. Well, now the whole point about it was that all in all, it wasn't a good night. I mean, if they'd have done another night, it would have been fine. But at the time, I remember it was mainly because we all said that Keith, it wasn't a good night for Keith. S uh, apart from the fact that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't recorded properly either. Now, this chap said to us, we can perform miracles in the studio. You know, you, you just don't know what, what can be done. Well, I thought, this is interesting, because I've had probably had more studio experience than you have, my friend. But... Um, certainly with rock and roll anyway so um, we he went away with these tapes and uh, <laughs> we, we had a call will you come and have a listen to them well, we went to have a listen to them and all that he'd done to it was um, whereas obviously people have been listening to what we were doing he'd overdubbed these cheers it sounded like a, a corrida a bullfight and so halfway through days of music Rah! you know which was nothing like what was really happening. It was just laughable, and we said, no, sorry, forget it, that's not coming up. But you see, once Led Zeppelin was around, and, uh, and, and living, so to speak, and doing very well at that, suddenly Epic decided, you know, you know what the record company's right, we all know the way it goes. Oh, look, we've got a tape with this chap on, Jimmy Page, so we'll put it out. So it went out, but it was immediately stopped. But... Uh, that's it. you know it's just the old greedy, greedy people. So you didn't have to go out and buy them, right? No, we just, uh, just slapped an injunction on them. Yeah, pretty quickly. The difference between like a, the Yardbirds and Zeppelin doing the same number is like you know, chalk and cheese. Uh, I guess it could be attributed to Keith Ralph's uh, inferior voice. No, no, no. I'm not knocking Keith Ralph's no, vocals. Just that's his own personal opinion. No, as long as we don't knock <coughs> Keith Ralph vocals at all. Mm -hmm. No. Has nothing to do with that. Has yeah. nothing to do with that. What it what it has to do with is the fact that the Yardbirds was a, a perfect vehicle for a guitarist to be able to because there were numbers where well, it's something which I continued into Zeppelin where you had they used to call it free form areas, which basically was improvisation. Well, once I was just the only guitarist there, and uh, unfortunately there's very little that uh, you can hear where Jeff and I were in the band. There's just happenings ten years time ago and stroll on. There's very little, unfortunately. That would have made a good live album. But where I was just on my own, I, obviously where I had all this, you know, these areas to, to sort of play and invent, I came up with a lot of my own passages and riffs. And consequently, I... You know, I, once once they decided that they didn't want to go on anymore. And curious enough, the one thing that Keith Ralph said when I was saying, "Well, surely we can try this, that, or the other," he came out with an extreme, quite a surprising statement. Actually, he said, uh, "Actually, the magic uh, magic of the band went for me when Eric went." 
which I found, I thought, well, I'm, I'm fighting a losing battle here because I thought that Jeff Beck had done all the interesting work in between that time, you know. But, uh, you know, that's, that was that. But, however, no, it was a fact that we had... Um, the musicians that we had in Led Zeppelin thought were more inventive, really, you know. Mm -hmm. that's so that's no slant on, on the Albers at all. It's I just see. that, you know... Yeah. No, that night, with the artwork, you guys had already been doing dazed and confused. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I guess sort of the, the concept of Zeppelin, the Zeppelin sound, was more or less exist at least in your mind. And, you know, to, to, to well, as I said, I had, I had. I had a whole number of passages and riffs that I'd worked out, which were purely my own invention. And, um, yes, I certainly knew what way to go with Led Zeppelin, but it wasn't just what I'd those parts of the art. That was part of it. The most important part that, that sets us aside from any other band at that time is the use of the acoustic and the way that it was employed. Exactly. Sure thing. The acoustic guitar right, right. and the way that it was employed. For instance, a good example for this, of, of what I'm talking about, and this is what I had planned in my mind before, before I'd even met Robert Plant, for instance. I had the arrangement for, for uh, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. And I mean, that was totally revolutionary. No one had ever thought of doing something like that before, in that style. Um, I actually heard that number on a, a Joan Baez LP, and, uh, and if you ever heard it, you probably wouldn't think it was the same thing at all. Uh, I thought it was a traditional number at the time. Um, and j just employing, you know, the, 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 the light and shade, the drama, the way that the actual electric parts come in with the drums. I mean, nobody had ever got anywhere, nobody had ever thought of anything like this before. Hmm. So that was all part of it, but, you know, th so there was a use of the acoustic and, uh, and also the, um, for instance, the folk roots are most important as well, um, because Black Mountain Side, in fact, is, uh, is an Irish melody, um, which, is, again, was a traditional song. And, um, but to use that with, like, tablet drums, of course, this is something which is a bit unusual. But th it was this... Um, having a complete, you know, sort of circle and cycle of music, many dimensions of it, from blues, rock, the experimental side, where you've got, like, within Dazed and Confused, the bowing of the guitar, etc. And I just, I, I, you know, that's the way that I wanted the band to be. Mm -hmm. right the, original, the, start. the original seeds of, like, innovation, though. It's all on the first album. It's all there. I mean, all, all of it. You know, it's just that they're there. From there, you, you see, you see the way that it grows and matures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a question that emanates from your mention of the use of the acoustic guitar. But uh, you've always shown a great respect for uh, Pentangle. Bert Yance. Well, not necessarily Pentangle, but uh, Bert Yance. Yeah, sure, sure thing. Yeah. The question was: Have you always liked, uh, like, uh, traditional acoustic music from when you were saved? Well, certainly that type of acoustic music. Yeah. Yeah. With well, Bert Yanks' yeah. style of playing and finger finger picking, uh, yeah, from like as opposed to just strumming, mm -hmm. yeah, finger picking and and movement. In fact, I, I went to see uh, Bert Yanks play once, and uh, and he does all this sort of bending string stuff on the on the records. And he didn't even have his own guitar. This chap didn't have his own guitar. He just borrowed a mm. a gut strung guitar for the night and he was still bending all the strings it sounded exactly the same and watching him play was like watching Julian Breen he was having all these sort of like bark inventions in, inversions right, not inventions what, what does he have that, that Breen doesn't why would you say prefer a Yench to a Breen I'm not saying I prefer I'm saying watching him was like watching a classical player mm -hmm. you know in, yeah. in his approach yeah. and the way that he fingered the guitar mm -hmm. you know at the time I was quite impressed with that it's quite an influence on me, actually. Getting back to the question, how old were you when you first got into that sort of acoustical traditional stuff? Well, I picked up the guitar at 13. <laughs> uh, and it took me quite a while to, to become acquainted with all these different people. I, I guess... I know I was doing studio work, anyway. Or was I... Or was I maybe I was at art college. Or I might have been at art college, I don't know. Well, it was long before was that, though. Oh, Lord, yeah. Yeah, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Acoustic guitarist I was listening to, I might add. Who else? Lorindo Almeida, mm -hmm. was, who, who is sort of classical and jazz yeah. as well. Uh, <coughs> um, 
you know, I was I was devouring every kind of guitar style that I could get. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said that the, <clears throat> the first album was very innovative because...